I think we need a new story of leadership, and that's part of my, that's why I'm talking to you today. That's what I want to talk to people about, is that we need to unleash those in you in here who are, who have the potential to be generative leaders. To provide a story to the people you report to and the people who report to you about how to manage adaptive challenges. And that it's not about you having a vision. Because you know what? Here's the problem with the vision thing. Nobody knows if the vision is any good until years down the road. For every Steve Jobs, you know, Lehman Brothers had a vision. Remember Lehman Brothers? Almost caused the collapse of the financial system. <laughs> Blackberry had a vision. Nortel Networks had a vision. They all had visions. It is true that if you have a compelling vision, if you're able to offer people a way of seeing the future that is compelling to them, you can create followership. And if you define leadership as the ability to create followership, that is leadership. The problem is, a lot of, for every great vision, there's 100 that fail. And in the Jim Collins uh, study, all those failing companies that failed at uncertainty, they all had visions. They made big bets, big bets on stuff, and they turned it out wrong and wiped out a whole lot of wealth and uh, people's jobs and so on and so forth. Right? It, I, I'm almost ready to get to the point where I'm saying, you know what? In a complex, uncertain environment, visions are dangerous. Right? Maybe, maybe they're the last thing we need, but we want them because they make us feel comfortable. They make us think that we know what we're doing. It, it creates the illusion of certainty to step into an always unknowable future. Where do generative images source these ideas from? How do they, how do they show up? Well, I want to give you, for me here, an iconic example. Before 1987, those of you who are old enough as I am to remember this, environmentalists and business people had nothing to say to each other. Right? Environmentalists all thought business people were crazed idiots who were driving Spaceship Earth into a death spiral. And business people all thought environmentalists wanted to live in agrarian peasant societies on a beach and eat bananas. And they had nothing to say to each other. And then in 1987, something happened that so transformed that narrative that across North America, Western Europe, after years and years of screaming, listen to us, listen to us, all of a sudden business government turned to Organizations like Greenpeace and said, okay, we're listening. What should we do? Right. That change was so profound and so rapid that Greenpeace Canada literally almost fell apart because then people are going, huh? you know, what do we do? Do we join the boards of companies and certify the greenness of their processes? You know, do we trust these people? It took them about 18 months to sort out that now they weren't going to do that. They were going to stay in an advocacy role. But my question to you is, what created that change? Here's what I think it was. A UN report, of all things, called the Brundtland Commission, offered us a generative image. And that generative image was sustainable development. And all of a sudden, business people could say, I'm, I'm for sustainable development. And the environmentalists could say, I'm for sustainable development. And all of a sudden, we had, an, we had a new idea that was compelling and attractive and it generated new action, and it generated new ideas. It's the iconic generative image of our time. 25 years later, it's still throwing off innovations. Right? It's still generating new ideas and new ways of acting, and, and, uh, and, and no one can define it. Because that's one of the core properties of a generative image. Right? A generative image is an unusual combination of words. Now, any image to be generative has to be, is generative within the context in which it's used. So a combination of words that might be generative in one organization might not be in another. Sustainable development is very, very unusual in, in, in the generative capacity it's had worldwide. One of the places that I often find generative images is when you take things that people have been stuck either or around and you stick them together. Right? People go, well, we can either be centralized or we can be decentralized. And some organization comes along, let's, let's create decentralized centralization. Right? And it's like, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, if that's compelling, and actually I, I have one case in my latest book where that's exactly what happened. Right? Uh, and I think it was a healthcare organization, actually, that, that, that decided to go for centralized decentralization. And right? it, 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 was, it, it seemed like, and you know, Generally, if you look at sustainable development, it's the same thing. It's, it's taking two opposites. At the time, environments, we can either you know, save the planet or we can develop economically. We can't have both. 
and you took an either nor situation and stuck them together. That's not the only place to find a generative image, but it's, it's one of the hottest ones. And, right? But that image has to be compelling to people. It calls on something we care about. And to me, that's the most important thing. If you want to create transformational change, you've got to frame it in a way people care about. If they don't care about it, it's not going to happen. And all too often, leaders frame the changes they're interested in some kind of techno-speak that uh, just, just has no energy to it. Um, so what these generative images do is they open up opportunities for new productive conversations. They create a space where people who need to be part of the conversation want to come to the conversation. Um, they go, well, we want to talk about sustainable development. You want to come? Right. Yeah, and then we start talking about what is it? And one of the things that makes you know, a generative image generative is that it's ambiguous. The Beatty School of Business decided about 15 years ago to make sustainability one of our core pillars. About a third of the faculty were adamantly against that. They thought it was crazy. No one can define it. Yeah. And, and to me, the whole point of a generative image is that it's, what makes it generative is that it, it has so many different facets to it we can project into it, it can lead to things we never thought about before. And I want to give you a couple of examples. This is from British Airways. Um, and the question they had was, how do we get airline employees to identify and act on innovations that will make us stand out from our competitors? Right. Now, that's kind of a mouthful. you know. Uh, that's not necessarily going to get a lot of people excited. Um, and the generative image they came up, for, came up with for that one was, how do we create exceptional customer arrival experiences? Now, that was a lot more interesting to the frontline folks in baggage handling and, and uh, people on the planes and the people taking people's tickets. A lot of people got excited about it because one of the things you know is that the people who are actually dealing with customers on the front line, they want to create great customer experiences. They want happy customers. They don't want people having to interact with the public that's pissed off at them all the time. Right? That was a generative image for them. This is the one I was just working on. How do we get unionized employees from all parts of the supply chain to generate and act on ideas for increasing the standardization of their work processes? Now, most people would think, that's, who wants to do that? Who wants to create more routines and standards? You know? Like if we said, hey, let's, you know, and this was, a, again, a cynical unionized workforce. And here's the thing they realized. They've been trying to standardize these work processes for years. right? And people wouldn't follow the rules. And once they finally gave up on the idea that they could control what other people were doing, and they could control people following the rules, right? but they also realized that the core of so much of the pain that people experienced, because in this organization, people were getting yelled at by their customers, and they had people hired up the food chain pounding on their heads, and because you know, so many of their processes were out of control, and there was a lot of reasons why that was. And, they, and if they could just standardize more, then things would be better. Here's what we came up with. Stress-free customer service. And we put a call out to this workforce, and so we'd like you to invite you into the room and talk about how do we create more stress-free customer service. And people wanted to show up for that conversation. Right? And they generated dozens of innovations. Mm -hmm.